defenders. While we wait for this press conference to get underway, can we take a minute as well, Gary, to talk about Huawei? Because mm. talking to various analysts here over the mm. past few days, lots of them have said this is a key issue. Yep. U.S. concerns over Huawei yep. are helping to build 5G infrastructure here yep. in the U.K. What are those concerns? Okay, so if you talk to uh, Americans in, in Washington and to the sort of security establishment there, they will tell you that, that the 5G revolution is something really new. It's not just like a step up from 3G to 4G. It is something brand new. It creates what they call the, the Internet of Things. So everything, I mean, I was on a, uh, listening into a call that the National Security Council gave, a briefing call uh, a couple of months ago, and they were saying, look, ima imagine you've got this coffee cup, a, a 5G coffee cup. At the moment, it's a coffee cup but because it's connected all the time it can be its firmware can be flashed and it can turn into something else now what that is I don't know a microphone a camera goodness knows what but they're saying this is completely a completely different world and that it, you're unable to stop the Chinese uh, from using uh, its muscle its sort of telecoms muscle uh, to either to get inside systems you don't want them to get inside or to cause problems and difficulties in networks uh, when they when there's a political problem to, to be sold. Now the view here in the UK is that you can you can securitize if you like you can sort of draw a ring of steel around the things that really matters to you your national security infrastructure your communications uh, your your sort of you know your GCHQ and all that kind of thing and the rest of the world the, the, the clever washing machine that you and I might have in our in our uh, in our laundry room you know we can do that and that's the distinction that's, that's going on here there's also of course a wider view and a wider problem which is the US battle with China over trade that can't be disentangled from from that as well as things stand Lucy Britain hasn't yet decided whether it's going to absolutely allow Huawei to be part of the 5G uh, infrastructure here but we had a couple of months ago didn't we a, a leak from the National Security Council here which suggested they were minded to go down this route that the Americans don't like of saying yes the, the Chinese can be involved to a certain extent and we are able to stop them getting access to the really important bits. And we should point out that Huawei is a private company and they absolutely have always denied haven't they Gary any yep. links to the Chinese government and say they would never be involved in uh, some of the things that have yes. been suggested but bringing you in Rob on the uh, Huawei issue uh, does any kind of deal depend on Theresa May has she been the one that's been pushing it forward so could it change when we have a new leader I mean the answer is to, to that question that uh, Theresa May I think had been minded uh, as Gary was uh, saying to, to take the view that look there is a way in which you could make sure that uh, Huawei uh, its involvement in the, G, in, the, in, the, in the 5G was kept separate from the things that really mattered to British security but of course Theresa, won't, Theresa May won't be around for much longer and so I, I think this is going to be an issue that, uh, that her successor will have to grapple with now whether that successor you know will take the view look actually our relationship with the United States is more important than staying on the right side of things with Huawei I, I simply don't know but actually rather interestingly I think it is going to raise some of uh, some of the issues that we're likely to see any British government grapple with in the post-Brexit era, and that is outside of the European Union and with our sort of traditional, with the UK's traditional relationship with the, with the US, or with Brussels, you know, how, how is it going to play things when it says part of, when the Brexiteers have said part of what Brexit is about is forming new relationships, trading relationships with the likes of India and China, and I think, great timing, I think we may just be about to see everyone leave. Bear with me. We are, Rob. Just take us through who's leaving now that you can see. You recognise any of Right. Well, that's that, that. Yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely. There is. I can see Gavin Barwell. He's the uh, Prime Minister's Chief of Staff. Uh, we've had some of the um, some of the Mike President's Pompeo. staff. So some of the. Yep. So some of the uh, some of the some of the key figures. So you, <laughs> you have to put up with me for a bit longer. Well, I don't. I don't think it's going to be too much longer before the uh, the principals. If you think about it, the, the kind of co-stars, the. Um, you know, the supporting cast, uh, supporting cast have made the journey, uh, and no doubt uh, the, the president and the prime minister will be along shortly. Lucy, there we goodness, there we go, burst of excitement. It's what counts for excitement when you're indeed. standing outside Downing Street for hours on end. <laughs> Yeah, that, that and Larry the Cat under the Beast are the two bits of excitement we've had no, for you so, today, Rob. I'm going to bring in. No, absolutely. But well, actually, I was going to just 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 to going back to what Gary was saying. The um, you know, 
it, it, there's the same sort of debate going on here uh, about Huawei, and, and that is the concern about it. Is, is it. is the United States really genuinely concerned? Does it genuinely think there's a security issue? Or, or is this about a more, you know, the beginnings, or, or I say the beginnings, or is it a continuation of what clearly is a sort of a, a, a rivalry for commercial economic dominance in the world between the United States and China? Hugh Gary O'Donoghue. Yeah, what do you think, Gary, that Huawei really is just leverage in this trade war? It's partly that. I think the concerns were there ahead of Donald Trump, to be fair. I think there were, you know, they are, there have been concerns among some chip manufacturers and others, and there have been, don't forget, there's been a, a bunch of cases in the United States, really since 2010, 2011 onwards, of, of Chinese, uh, of people being uh, prosecuted for being effectively espionage agents on behalf of Chinese industry. So there, there has been a sort of a bubbling problem going on uh, with that, that that predates the president's kind of trade policy. But yeah, sure, um, this is, is something he sees as leverage too. Bear in mind that he's already slapped these tariffs on $250 billion worth of Chinese imports into the country. He's threatened to do more. Uh, the Chinese have retaliated. The American administration has had to pay out sort of subsidies to Midwest farmers to try and keep them afloat while uh, China, the Chinese are no longer buying as much pork or soybeans and all those kinds of things. So this is all part of a piece. And of course, uh, and, uh, we see, we, here we come now. Is so, it, yeah. It's Ivanka Trump Ivanka leaving there. now. Yeah. Quite a few of them were down the street today. Yeah, I think everyone would have want a piece of that, wouldn't they? Yeah. <laughs> Of course, it's um, the strike them, Lucy. It's very strange down in because It's actually very small inside. You know, it's nothing. No, well, the White House isn't large anywhere. either, though. The White it? House is pretty small too. Yeah, but um, it's, this is really a big London townhouse. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you what we're going to expect, more about what we can expect at the press conference, Gary, because mm. a lot has been made about, you know, where the special relationship is at, yeah. and I guess around values as well, and that is what the Queen spoke about, yes. and also what perhaps we can see Theresa May speaking about. Yes. It's, you know, these values that are vitally important to Britain and the relationship that has always been with the US, but yes. is there a question as to whether President Trump also has these values of, you know, a functioning global system around trade, around, you know, some of the many other uh, military alliances and things. I mean, he's been critical of NATO too. Very critical. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, th I think that's right. And I think there's a lot of doubt, certainly, not just in the UK, but in among other allies too, about President Trump's commitment to those values. We'll hear what he has to say about that this afternoon. But if, from the UK's point of view, bear in mind, I mean, ever since Churchill, ever since the, the end of the Second World War, I mean, every Prime Minister of, of whatever side, I mean, to lesser or greater extent, has seen the UK's national interest has been absolutely bound up with, uh, with staying as uh, close as possible to the United States of America as you can. Uh, that has, has been a sort of, an absolute sort of cornerstone of a of British foreign policy uh, for the best part of, of, of 80 years. It's, it, it's absolutely crucial. And I think the view will be taken, a slightly longer term view will be taken here inside places like the Foreign Office that, you know, presidents are now term limited, aren't they? They can do, they can do eight years, not like FDR in the Second World War, they can now only do eight years and that there's, there's much more to lose in a sense by burning bridges. Uh, the question is what what, what, will, you know, what will happen in the next uh, two, perhaps six years if the president is re-elected. Re re you know, the problem, I mean, Rob was talking earlier about the sort of the position of Britain between America and the US and, and, and all British leaders have really seen America, particularly from Churchill on, was as a bridge between the United States and Europe. And the danger, of course, with, with Brexit and things like that is for some people they will see Britain becoming a ditch rather than a bridge. And Rob, even more important, I suppose, because Britain is leaving one multilateral institution, leaving uh, the EU. Therefore, its relationship perhaps with the US becomes even more important in some people's eyes. Rob, are you still with us? I am indeed. But that was. <laughs> Sorry, can you, can, you, can you hear me now, Lucy? Yes? yes, we've got you now, Rob. I was just, uh, okay. uh, Gary and I were just talking about the importance of the bilateral relationship, no, 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 I, particularly, I, I, and I was no, saying, as, I, I, as Britain leaves the EU, 
some people will see that as it being you know, even more critical. Uh, absolutely, and I, and I heard Gareth, uh, I had his Gareth instead of a bridge, a, a ditch. Look, it was always going to be the case that one of the consequences of Brexit was that the, the United Kingdom would have to pivot of necessity from Brussels uh, to Washington. Uh, that, that was always going to be the case, you know, after, going, after, being, after being the bridge. And for some people, you know, that is really problematic. But I think, I think this issue, this, this raises the, the wider issue of bringing in the Huawei as, as well. Brexit was always going to raise questions not just about a membership of the European Union as if it was some kind of club, like being a member of a tennis club, but it was actually about Britain's entire standing in the world. How would it affect our relationship with the United States? How will it affect the kind of economic model we have? How will it affect our trade policy? Our whole standing in the world, what will it do? Can, is there a way in which Britain can open up to, to Asia, to, to India and to China without upsetting other parts of its previous relationships? So that's all the kind of stuff that's thrown up into the air by Brexit. But undoubtedly, absolutely, the issue of pivoting from Brussels to Washington. And I think one of the things that having someone like President Trump in the White House has shown is that maybe in normal times, if Britain was pivoting from Brussels to Washington when someone like Barack Obama was in the White House, that would probably be a bit easier for, for British people to deal with. But I think pivoting from, a, pivoting from Brussels to a, a Donald Trump Washington, I mean, that, that is a different matter altogether. Now, there are plenty of people in the UK who say, fine, bring it on. Donald Trump is a disruptor. Brexit is disruptive. We needed to sort of shake up the system. We needed to shake up the way politics are done. But obviously not everybody uh, thinks like that. And I can tell you in the sort of, in the buildings around here, around Downing Street, where I'm, I'm sort of one side of me is the sort of, behind me is Downing Street, then there's the, there's the Foreign Office, the Treasury. I can assure you that in those bastions of the British establishment, they're very, very worried about all of these changes that seem to be afoot. Absolutely, Rob. Thanks so much for your thoughts and thanks for joining us on Impact. We are getting ready for a press conference between the President of the United States, Donald Trump, and the British Prime Minister, Theresa May. They have been meeting here at uh, number 10 Downing Street. Some fairly contentious issues are on the agenda for them, possibly uh, doing business with Huawei is the one that we've been focusing on recently. And, of course, a possible trade deal after Brexit. Uh, President Trump saying earlier this morning that Britain can have a very, very, substantial trade deal with the US after it leaves the EU and even suggesting to Theresa May earlier that she should stick around to do that deal uh, because we're in the final hours really of Theresa May's leadership here in the UK. Uh, we've also been watching the leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn. He has been addressing protesters because this is a very peaceful scene outside number 10 apart from all the media who are there but just a short while, way away are all those protesters who have gathered to voice their anger at President Trump's visit and uh, in an unprecedented move, the leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn, has been in amongst them and he has urged Mr. Trump to think about peace as he addressed protesters in Westminster. And right on cue, here is Theresa May and President Trump with their spouses, Melania, the First Lady, and Philip May. Not taking any uh, questions there. Many were shouted at them. A very short walk to the Foreign Office where this press conference will be uh, taking place, of course. Uh, there are some of the Trump children as well. We saw Ivanka earlier leaving with John Bolton, the uh, US National Security Advisor. We saw Mike Pompeo leaving as well. So a big team uh, from both countries who have been inside Number 10 Downing Street and are now going to be at this uh, press conference, which we're expecting shortly. With me is my colleague, Cathy Kay. Uh, Cathy, what do you think we can expect at the press conference? I guess, expect the unexpected. Yeah, I mean, people who are looking for that Love Actually moment where the British Prime Minister turns on the President and says, you have to be a better friend to the United Kingdom, may be disappointed. But there are certainly issues of contention. You've been speaking about them. Uh, Huawei, uh, front and foremost just at the moment on people's minds and whether there is any difference between the British government's position on dealing with Huawei and the White House's position which is you know they are lobbying quite hard their allies around the world not to do business with the Chinese tech firm uh, there's serious concerns amongst security officials on both sides of the Atlantic to be fair about whether Huawei should have access to 5G networks 
um, in the Five Eyes uh, countries, but also uh, issues around Iran and whether there should be a policy of maximum pressure when it comes to sanctions on Iran. Some European officials would like to see those relaxed a little and to allow Iran access to some world markets. Uh, there are also issues, of course, around climate change. And then there is the bilateral issue of this trading relationship and whether the president is um, portraying the situation accurately when he says that the UK will get a very good deal after it's left the European Union. Some skepticism amongst British officials that I have spoken to that that will actually be the case. And after the press conference, Katty, there has been some speculation that President Trump will take time out to meet Michael Gove, mm -hmm. uh, who could be the next leader of the Conservatives. He's one of the contenders. He's spoken away for 20 minutes to Boris Johnson. How appropriate is that, that he's weighing Look, you know, He's this? not the first president to weigh in on British affairs. Barack Obama weighed in on the Brexit issue, not on individuals, on individual politicians, but did weigh in, tipping his uh, hand and saying that he thought Brexit was a, not a good idea for the United Kingdom. And there was quite a lot of fuss when Barack Obama made that position clear. Brexiteers didn't like that, that the president weighed in on it. So uh, it, I'm not sure that it made any difference in the end in the referendum, and I'm not sure that Donald Trump weighing in and speaking to Boris Johnson on the phone for 20 minutes or uh, perhaps having a meeting with Michael Gove will make a difference in the leadership context. Traditionally, you don't weigh in in leadership context in other um, countries. You don't think it plays well for them domestically to be seen I don't, talking to the I, I honestly don't think that the vast majority of the American public is very focused on the Conservative Party's leadership um, contest at the moment. They're probably much more focused on the royal part of this visit. Oh, we're just seeing here, I'm being directed towards the pictures, uh, Melania Trump leaving with uh, Philip May. What were your thoughts on last night, Katie, and the state banquet? L th those were the kinds of images that they wanted, and that tribute to the British-American alliance and the history of that alliance is what American officials and British officials have been keen to say this visit is about. It's not specifically about Donald Trump, but the kinds of things that the Her Majesty was saying about the history of the relationship in this particular week where we commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day. That's exactly why the President is here this week, and it's fitting that that long-standing relationship is paid tribute to, and in the moment we are at a moment of transition in the relationship where we've had one model of relationship of tight ties for the last 75 years and we could be moving into something else. Here is the President and Theresa May coming out now for this uh, press conference outside the Foreign Office. Do we expect them, Cathy, to take uh, many questions? Do we know the format of this? If you're holding a press conference, presumably they're going to take press questions from both uh, British American and, and British American press. members of the press. Let's have a listen then. This week we commemorate the extraordinary courage and sacrifice of those who gave their lives for our liberty on D-Day 75 years ago. As leaders prepare to gather here from across the world, it is fitting that we begin with a celebration of the special relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States, enduring partners who stood side by side on that historic day and every day since. For generations at the heart of the transatlantic alliance has been our shared democratic values, our common interests and our commitment to justice. It is that unity of purpose that will preserve the deep-rooted ties between our people and underpin our nation's security and prosperity for the next 75 years and beyond. So I am very pleased to welcome the President of the United States of America on this state visit to the United Kingdom. For the past two and a half years, the President and I have had the duty and privilege of being the latest guardians of this precious and profound friendship between our countries. As with our predecessors, when we have faced threats to the security of our citizens and our allies, we have stood together and acted together. When Russia used a deadly nerve agent on the streets of our country, alongside the UK's expulsions, the President expelled 60 Russian intelligence officers, the largest contribution towards an unprecedented global response. And in Syria, when innocent men, women and children were victims of a barbaric chemical weapons attack, Britain and America 
along with France, carried out targeted strikes against the regime. Since we spoke about NATO during my first visit to the White House, we have maintained our support for this crucial alliance. Thanks in part to your clear message on burden sharing, Donald, we have seen members pledge another $100 billion, increasing their contributions to our shared security. And I'm pleased to announce that NATO will soon be able to call on the UK's Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers and F-35 fighter jets to help tackle threats around the world. Today we've discussed again the new and evolving challenges to our security, our values and our way of life. We share the same view about their origin and our objectives in meeting them. But like Prime Ministers and Presidents before us and no doubt those that will come after, we can also differ sometimes on how to confront the challenges we face. I've always talked openly with you, Donald, when we have taken a different approach and you've done the same with me. I've always believed that cooperation and compromise are the basis of strong alliances and nowhere is this more true than in the special relationship. Today we've discussed again the importance of our two nations working together to address Iran's destabilizing activity in the region and to ensure Tehran cannot acquire a nuclear weapon. Although we differ on the means of achieving that, as I've said before, the UK continues to stand by the nuclear deal. It is clear that we both want to reach the same goal. It is important that Iran meets its obligations and we do everything to avoid escalation, which is in no one's interest. Recognizing our nations as safer and more prosperous when we work together on the biggest challenges of our time, I also set out the UK's approach to tackling climate change and our continued support for the Paris Agreement. And we also spoke about China, recognizing its economic significance and that we cannot ignore action that threatens our shared interests or values. As we've deepened our cooperation on security, including our joint military operations and our unparalleled intelligence sharing, so our economies too are ever more tightly bound together. Every morning, one million Americans get up and go to work for British companies in America, and one million Britons do the same for American companies here. Our trading relationship is worth over £190 billion a year, and we're the largest investors in each other's economies, with mutual investments valued at as much as $1 trillion. Mr. President, you and I agreed the first time we met that we should aim for an ambitious free trade agreement when the UK leaves the EU. And from our positive discussions today, I know that we both remain committed to this. I'm also sure that our economic relationship will only grow broader and deeper, building on the conversations we had and the ideas we heard from UK and US businesses when we met them earlier today. Tomorrow we will sit down in Portsmouth with our fellow leaders to reaffirm the enduring importance of the Western Alliance and the shared values that underpin it. And as we look to the future, in the years and in the generations ahead, we will continue to work together to preserve the alliance that is the bedrock of our shared prosperity and security, just as it was on the beaches of Normandy 75 years ago. Mr. President. Well, thank you, Prime Minister May. Milani and I are honored to return to London as our nations commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day in World War II. We want to thank Her Majesty the Queen, who I had a lovely dinner with last night, a fantastic person, fantastic woman, for so graciously inviting us to this state visit. It was very, very special. Our thanks as well to Prime Minister and Mr. May for the warm welcome they've given the First Lady and me as we remember the heroes who laid down their lives to rescue civilization itself. On June 6, 1944, tens of thousands of young warriors left these shores by the sea and air to begin the invasion of Normandy and the liberal of Europe and the brutal Nazi occupation. It was a liberation like few people have seen before. Among them were more than 130,000 American and British brothers in arms. Through their valor and sacrifice, they secured our homelands and saved freedom for the world. Tomorrow, Prime Minister May and I will attend a commemoration ceremony in Portsmouth 
one of the key embarkation points for the invasion. More than one and a half million American service members were stationed right here in England in advance of the landings that summer. The bonds of friendship forged here and sealed in blood on those hollowed beaches will endure forever. Our special relationship is grounded in common history, values, customs, culture, language, and laws. Our people believe in freedom and independence as a sacred birthright and cherished inheritance worth defending at any cost. As the Prime Minister and I discussed in our meetings today and yesterday, the United States and the United Kingdom share many goals and priorities around the world. I want to thank the people of the United Kingdom for their service and partnership in our campaign to defeat ISIS. As we announced a few months ago, ISIS's territorial caliphate in Syria and Iraq has been completely obliterated, defeated. The United Kingdom is also a key partner in NATO. The Prime Minister and I agree that our NATO allies must increase their defense spending. We've both been working very hard toward that end. And we are very current, and some of them are not. We can't allow that to happen. But I appreciate everything you've done in that regard. We expect a growing number of nations to meet the minimum 2 percent of GDP requirement. To address today's challenges, all members of the alliance must fulfill their obligations. They have no choice. They must fulfill their obligation. Among the pressing threats facing our nations is the development and spread of nuclear weapons. Perhaps that's our greatest threat. The United States and the United Kingdom are determined to ensure that Iran never develops nuclear weapons and stops supporting and engaging in terrorism. And I believe that will happen in protecting our nations. We also know that the border security is national security. Today, the Prime Minister and I discussed our thriving economic relationship. Both countries are doing very well and participated in a roundtable with industry and business leaders. I can say probably the biggest business leaders anywhere in the world. Our nations have more than one trillion dollars invested in each other's economics. The United Kingdom is America's largest foreign investor in our largest European export market. That's a lot of importance. As the UK makes preparations to exit the European Union, the United States is committed to a phenomenal trade deal between the U.S. and the U.K. There is tremendous potential in that trade deal. I say probably two and even three times of what we're doing right now. Tremendous potential. Seventy-five years ago this Thursday, courageous Americans and British patriots set out from this island toward history's most important battle. They stormed forward out of ships and airplanes, risking everything to defend our people and to ensure that the United States and Britain would forever remain sovereign and forever remain free. Following this press conference, Prime Minister May, Mr. May, the First Lady, my family and I will visit the legendary Churchill War Rooms beneath the streets of London. I look forward to that. In his famous speech on this day in June 1940, Prime Minister Churchill urged his countrymen to defend our island whatever the cost may be. As we mark this solemn anniversary of D-Day, we remember that the defense of our nations does not begin on the battlefield, but within the heart of every patriot. Today, let us renew our pledge engraved at the American Cemetery in Normandy and inscribed by President Dwight Eisenhower in St. Paul's Cathedral right here in London that the cause for which they died shall live. Prime Minister May, it's been a true honor. I have greatly enjoyed working with you. You are a tremendous professional and a person that loves your country dearly. Thank you very much. Really an honor. Thank you for the invitation to memorialize our fallen heroes and for your partnership in protecting and advancing the extraordinary alliance between the American and the British people. It's the greatest 
alliance the world has ever known. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we're going to take two questions from the UK media and two questions from the American media. Uh, I'll start with Beth Rigby. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister President Trump. Beth Rigby from Sky News. Um, for you, President Trump, as you hold talks with the current Prime Minister, the leader of Her Majesty's opposition has been addressing a protest rally against your visit in Trafalgar Square. He says he's disappointed you attacked the London Mayor and he criticised your record on refugees. What do you have to say to him? And is this man someone you could do a trade deal with? And to you, Prime Minister, do you think that Sadiq Khan is a stone-cold loser? Thank you. You're talking about the Mayor of London. Is that who you said? Yes? Well, I think he's been a uh, not very good mayor, from what I understand. He's done a poor job. Crime is up. A lot of problems. And I don't think he should be criticizing uh, a representative of the United States that can do so much good for the United Kingdom. Uh, we talked about it before. He should be positive, not negative. He's a negative force, not a positive force. And if you look at what he said, he hurts the people of this great country. And I think he should actually focus on his job. It'd be a lot better if he did that. He could straighten out some of the problems that he has and probably some of the problems that he's caused. Thank you. Can I? Jerry, yes, he wanted to meet with me, and I told him no. Yes. Well, I don't know Jeremy Corbyn. Never met him. Never spoke to him. He wanted to meet today or tomorrow, and I, I decided that I would not do that. Uh, I think that he is, from where I come from, somewhat of a negative force. I think that uh, people should look to do things correctly as opposed to criticize. I really don't like critics as much as I like and respect people that get things done. So I've decided not to meet. As far as the protests, I have to tell you, because I commented on it yesterday, uh, we left the Prime Minister, the Queen, the Royal Family, there were thousands of people on the streets cheering. And even coming over today, there were thousands of people cheering. And then I heard that there were protests. I said, where are the protests? I don't see any protests. I did see a small protest today when I came, very small. So a lot of it is fake news, I hate to say. But you saw the, the people waving the American flag, waving your flag. It was tremendous spirit and love. There was great love. It was an alliance. And I didn't see the protesters until just a little while ago, and it was a very, very small group of people put in for political reasons. So it was fake news. Thank you. And I would say to both the Mayor of London and to Jeremy Corbyn, uh, the discussions that we have had today are about the future of this most important relationship between the US and the UK. As the President described it, the greatest alliance the world has seen. It is this deep special relationship and partnership between the United States and the United Kingdom that ensures our safety and security and the safety and security of others around the world too. And it is this relationship that helps to ensure there are jobs that employ people here in the UK and in the United States that underpins our prosperity and our future. That is a relationship we should cherish. It is a relationship we should build on. It is a relationship we should be proud of. Mr. It's President, a very would you like to... big, and this really is a very big and important alliance. And I think people should act positively toward it because it means so much for both countries means so much, and it's been so good. Uh, Steve Holland, yes, go ahead, Steve. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Is that on? There. What is your current view on Brexit, sir? Should Britain leave the European Union if there is no agreement by October 31st? And for the Prime Minister, what would be the ramifications for the UK if there is not a deal? Well, I don't like to take positions in things that I'm not, you know, really... Uh, I understand the issue very well. I, I really predicted what was going to happen. Some of you remember that prediction. It was a strong prediction made at a certain location on a development we were opening the day before it happened. 
and I thought it was going to happen because of immigration more than anything else, but probably it happens for a lot of reasons. But I would say, yeah, I would think that it will happen, and it probably should happen. This is a great, great country, and it wants its own identity. It wants to have its own borders. It wants to run its own affairs. This is a very, very special place, and I think it deserves a special place. And I thought maybe for that reason, and for others, but that reason it was going to happen. Yeah, I think it will happen. And I believe the Prime Minister has brought it to a very good point where something will take place in the not-too-distant future. I think she's done a very good job. Uh, I, I believe it would be good for the country, yes. And uh, from my point of view, uh, I believe it is important for us to deliver Brexit. We gave that choice to the British people. Uh, Parliament overwhelmingly gave the choice to the British people. We should now deliver on that choice. I continue to believe that actually it's in the best interests of the UK to leave the European Union in an orderly way with a deal. I think we have a good deal. Sadly, the Labour Party and other MPs have so far stopped us from delivering uh, Brexit and that deal. But we will, but obviously this is an issue that is going to continue here in the UK. I think the important thing is we deliver Brexit and once we're out of the European Union we will be able to do what we've been talking about today and develop not just that free trade agreement but a broader economic partnership into the future. If I could just follow up on a related matter. Mr. President, are you prepared to impose limits on intelligence sharing with Britain if they do not put in place some restrictions on Huawei? No, because we're going to have absolutely an agreement on Huawei and everything else. We have an incredible intelligence relationship and we will be able to work out any differences. I think uh, we're not going to have it. We did discuss it. Uh, I see absolutely no limitations. We've never had limitations. This is a truly great ally and partner and we'll have no problem with that. Okay? Francis. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Francis Elliott from The Times, D uh, do you agree with your ambassador that the entire economy needs to be on the table in a future trade talk, a trade deal, including the NHS? Uh, and Prime Minister, are you tempted to take the Prime Minister up, uh, President up to the word and stick around for a bit until the trade deal is done? I think we're going to have a great trade deal, yes. I think we're going to have a great and very comprehensive trade deal. I can't hear him. Right? It's the National Health Service. He says, should the National Health Service be on the table? Look, I think everything with the trade deal is on the table. When, you, when you're dealing in trade, everything's on the table. So NHS or anything else, or a lot, a lot more than that. But everything will be on the table, absolutely. But the point about making trade deals is, of course, that both sides negotiate and come to uh, an agreement about what should or should not be in that trade deal for the, uh, for the future. And as regards your second question, Francis, nice try. Uh, but, uh, but no, look, I'm a woman of my word. Mr. President, would you like to? John, please. Uh, Mr. President, thank you. Uh, Mr. President, uh, domestically, uh, in recent days, Mexico has stepped up apprehensions and deportations of Central American migrants. Uh, That's good. This could possibly be in, in uh, response to your threat of tariffs. Has Mexico Not possibly be? Has, has Mexico done enough to avoid tariffs, which will be imposed in some six days from now? No, we haven't and, started yet. And and. But the threat is out there. Uh, yeah, the threat is out there, but we haven't really started yet. No, this will take effect next week, and, and what 5%. You, and what do you think of Republicans who say that they may take action to block you imposing those tariffs? No, I don't think they will do that. I think if they do, it's foolish. Uh, there's nothing more important than borders. I've had tremendous Republican support. I have a 90%, 94% approval rating as of this morning in the Republican Party. That's an all-time record. Can you believe that? Isn't that something? I love records. But we have a 94% approval rating in the Republican Party. Uh, I want to see security at our border. I'm going to see great trade. I'm going to see a lot of things happening. And that is happening. And as you know, Mexico called. They want to meet. They're going to meet on Wednesday. Uh, Secretary Pompeo is going to be at the meeting, along with a few others that are very good at this. And we are going to see if we can do something. But I think it's more likely that the tariffs go on. And we'll probably be talking during the time that the tariffs are on and they're going to be paid. And if they don't step up and give us security for our nation, look, millions of people are flowing through Mexico. That's unacceptable. Millions and millions of people are coming right through Mexico. It's a 2,000-mile journey. 
and they're coming up to our border. And our Border Patrol, which is incredible, they're apprehending them, but our laws are bad because the Democrats don't want to pass laws that could be passed in 15 minutes, that could be passed quickly. In one day, it could change. But even beyond the laws, Mexico shouldn't allow millions of people to try and enter our country, and they could stop it very quickly. And I think they will. And if they won't, we're going to put tariffs on. And every month those tariffs go from 5% to 10% to 15% to 20 and then to 25%. And what will happen then is all of those companies that have left our country and gone to Mexico are going to be coming back to us. And that's okay. That's okay. But I think Mexico will step up and do what they should have been done. And I don't want to hear that Mexico is run by the cartels and the drug lords and the coyotes. I don't want to hear about that. A lot of people are saying that. Mexico has something to prove, but I don't want to hear that they're run by the cartels. You understand. You report on it all the time. A lot of people do. That would be a terrible thing. Mexico should step up and stop this onslaught, this invasion into our country, John. And, uh, Prime, Prime Minister May, you, you tried three times to get a deal on Brexit. At, at this point, do you believe that a deal on Brexit is possible, or is this a Gordian knot? President Trump says that you didn't take his advice in terms of negotiation. Uh, should you have, uh, would that have made a difference? And President Trump, if I could ask a follow-up, uh, you had a conversation with Boris Johnson. Uh, could we ask what you spoke about and will you meet with Michael Gove today? Well, first of all, on the first issue, as I said in answer to an earlier question, I still believe, I personally believe, that it is in the best interests of the UK to leave the European Union with a deal. I believe there is a good deal on the, uh, on the table. Obviously, uh, it will be for whoever succeeds me as Prime Minister to take this issue forward. Uh, what is paramount, I believe, is delivering on Brexit for the, for the British people. Um, and I seem to remember the, the President suggested that I sued the European Union, which uh, we didn't do. We went into negotiations and we came out with a good deal. Yeah. That's not such a I would have sued, but that's okay. <laughs> I would have sued and settled, maybe, but you never know. She's probably a better negotiator than I am, Jeremy. But you know what? She has got it, in a sense, John. That deal is teed up. I think that deal is really teed up. I think they have to do something. And perhaps you won't be given the credit that you deserve if they do something. But I think you deserve a lot of credit. I really do. I think you deserve a lot of credit. Okay. Yes, John? So I know Boris. Uh, I like him. I've liked him for a long time. He's, uh, I think he'd do a very good job. I know Jeremy. I think he'd do a very good job. I don't know Michael. But uh, would he do a good job, Jeremy? Tell me. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. An interesting press conference there from President Trump and Theresa May, uh, ending to laughter from the gathered journalists and uh, the Trump family. John Bolton, you can see just there uh, with the glasses on at the front of shot as well, the U.S. security advisor. And uh, many things to go through with Katie Kay, who is with me now that we heard uh, from both of the leaders, and I think mostly what people will be pondering over is the answers to the questions, Katty, rather than their established comments, their written comments at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, what was the sort of key thing that you know? You, you Look, I mean, it's, it, the, you run through, through what he, they were asked about Brexit, the trading relationship, China, um, and there are a host of things around which there are disagreements at the moment between these two countries. And it was interesting, for example, on the issue of a future trading relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom post-Brexit. Uh, they were asked specifically would the National Health Service be on the table. Uh, Theresa May seemed to be suggesting that, you know, uh, it there's, would a negotiation. there's a negotiation to be had. But the President saying very firmly, look, everything with a trade deal is on the table. The NHS or anything else is on the table. So reiterating the kinds of comments that the American ambassador had made uh, before Mr. Trump's visit, which of course are very controversial here in the UK, but making no bones about it, yeah, they expect that. Now, 
from speaking to people who are involved in these negotiations over trade, the two areas that the Americans really would like better access to British markets are agriculture and pharmaceuticals. The fact that the NHS manages to negotiate low pharmaceutical prices so that Brits pay lower prices for their drugs than people do in the United States is something that rankles with Americans and with the American government and they would like to change that. And I think that's part of what they're talking about when they say that the NHS will be on the table. And the leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn, just speaking shortly before this press conference, two protesters said, hands off our NHS. He made it very clear that if he was in power, he would not have the NHS as part of any negotiations. And some of the contenders for the Conservative leadership contest as, so as well are well. also saying that everybody here knows what an incredibly sensitive issue it is. And that's why it was interesting that Donald Trump didn't hold back from saying, yes, the NHS will be on the table. On Jeremy Corbyn, because he was asked about that and the protests, what yeah. did you make of some well, of how the president responded. He seemed to sort of say, I've seen thousands of people cheering from me right. here rather than protesting. Specific That's just not true. Specifically, he said there were thousands of people cheering last night, and he said again that there were thousands of people cheering again today. Now, we haven't seen those pictures of thousands of people cheering. We did see supporters of the president out here yesterday. Um, it wasn't thousands. It was maybe a hundred, and there have been other supporters of the president around the city as well. He did then say that he hasn't seen any of it, and it was fake news that there were protests. Now, I wish we could have shown you the split scheme of the president and there you see them right we're bringing them up now maybe the president hasn't had a chance to see these pictures but these are pictures clearly of people who are protesting against the president we understand there are thousands of protesters against president trump so when he says this is fake news that's just not the case no, he also did say i don't, don't like criticism <laughs> he said he didn't like, and he was asked again of course about his comments about um Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, right at the beginning of this question and answer session and about Jeremy Corbyn as well. He called both of them negative. He said that Mr. Khan has not done a good job in London, that he should, shouldn't be criticizing an American official in the way that he has done. He was similarly critical of uh, Jeremy Corbyn. He mentioned, Cathy, that Jeremy Corbyn had asked to meet with him on a Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Well, he that said he had, had said asked no. to meet with him on this yes. trip. And he said that he Which I think didn't will come as a surprise to some people, and it's certainly Jeremy Corbyn has I'm just going through uh, my notes uh, here. Jeremy Corbyn hasn't said that he, he has asked me. No, he says that, Mr. and we would it'd be interested to see what Mr. Corbyn says in response to that, but he said that Mr. Corbyn wanted to meet with me. I told him no, I've never met with him, I've never spoken to him, and then he said he's somewhat of a negative force. So President Trump used fake news in that press conference. Mm -hmm. um, I want to bring in your experience here on this Brexit issue when he said, I predicted that Brexit will happen. Is that true? Also, it was, I was quite interested to listen to the wording of that because he said, as you'll remember, I predicted that Brexit will happen the day before breakfast at a development. Now, we do know that the president talked about Brexit the day after Brexit happened and said that he had predicted it. But I have not heard the tape of him predicting it before Brexit happened. What he's saying there is that he knew that it was going to happen because of the issue of immigration. Uh, and he felt it. This has been something of a controversy before because Donald Trump has claimed in the past that he predicted Brexit before it was going to happen. He was referring to his time when he was at his golf course and of course that was the day after the results came in. If there is somewhere that he predicted it before that at a development somewhere, he made it sound like a construction development or something, I haven't heard that tape. Before. He said that he thinks Brexit will be good for the country. It will happen. It should happen. Britain wants its own identity borders and to run its own affairs. But he didn't specifically, Cathy, address this issue of whether it should happen if there is no deal. No. Has he said that before? He Does was he asked specifically that? that question, should it happen even if there is no deal? And he didn't reply. He said, yes, it should. But it wasn't clear whether he was saying, yes, it should happen even if there is no deal. It, he has made it clear in the past that he wants Brexit to happen and that he thinks uh, uh, that he is more in favour of a, what has been called a hard Brexit, leaving with no deal at all. And members of the administration that I have spoken to have said that the problem with Britain staying and staying part of the customs union is that it would shackle a future potentially UK-US trading relationship. And so I think that's what the president is referring to, that it's in the US's interest if it's going to have free reign when it comes to drafting a trading relationship with the UK, that, the, that Britain should be totally outside of the, U, uh, of the European Union, and if that means leaving 
entirely because they can't stay unless there's some sort of customs union agreement, they would prefer them to leave entirely. The other big issue and it came up in the press conference was Huawei. He said, absolutely, uh, we will have an agreement, we're going to work things out, there are not going to be any limitations. He wasn't so specific. He, well, actually, he's changed his position slightly from before he came because before he flew here to the United Kingdom, he seemed to be suggesting that the United Kingdom had to be very careful about its relationship with Huawei in terms of intelligence sharing and with that the United would be States. Limited if a deal and today was done he was Huawei. saying categorically, no, there will be no limitations. The United Kingdom is a very valued intelligence sharing partner of the United States. Um, and so he seemed to be rowing back a little but bit. But it wasn't made that. clear if that was because Britain is also going to change its position on doing a deal with Huawei. That was, we not, just don't that was not made clear. No. Can you explain to our viewers, because we're following closely, of course, all the events here and with this visit, but uh, the question on Mexico, Katie, just to put that into context. <laughs> so the president, before he came here, said that he was going to impose 5% tariffs on all Mexican goods coming into the United States later this month, and then at every month an extra 5% if the Mexicans did not implement changes on their immigration that would stop immigrants coming from Mexico into the United States. Now they haven't said what those changes specifically have to be. So there's nothing specific according to what the president has announced in terms of what the Mexicans have to achieve. The problem with this is that it hurts American businesses. A lot of trading goods come over the border. Businesses don't like this. They've already said that they don't like this. This will raise the cost of production in the United States. A car park, for example, crosses the US-Mexican border several times before it is finally made into a car in the United States. So if there was going to be a tariff on that car park, that boosts up uh, production prices for cars and therefore it's passed on to consumers in the US. This is something Republicans don't like. It's something that American businesses don't like. It's something that the president has just announced, but it's not quite clear what the goal is the end result is of what they want the Mexicans to do in terms of clamping down on immigration. It's something, by the way, that is almost impossible for the Mexican government to do. Other governments around the world have also tried to totally clamp down on migrants. We know, we've covered this story many times in different areas of the world, it's a very hard thing to do. And finally, Cassie, on the dynamic between him and Theresa May, he has been incredibly critical of Theresa May. And yet, there he was, full of He was very gracious yes. towards her. He was very gracious towards her today, that it's been an honour to work with her, um, that it's been a privilege and that she's somebody that really loves her country. He was, he was no, I noticed that too, Lucy, interesting. He was very complimentary about her. Okay, Cassie, always good to have your thoughts. Uh, Cassie with us throughout the day here on BBC World News. But we're just going to bring in Michael Hewson, who is Chief Market Analyst at CMC Markets joining me now from London's financial district. Michael, did you have a chance to listen to any of uh, uh, President Trump there? I certainly did, and I have to say I felt he was almost, uh, I felt that the speech, it was the first time he'd actually read it. It did lack a little bit of emotion, and shall we say. And what about his uh, thoughts on uh, Brexit and the fact that he is, uh, it seems to us, saying that he supports a no deal if it came to that? Yeah, I think, you know, talk of a trade deal is a little bit putting the cart before the horse here because I think we need to leave the EU first and it doesn't appear to, at the time of speaking that there is no majority in Parliament for that to happen and it's unlikely to happen before the 31st of October and more than that, it's not in President, President Trump's gift to grant a trade deal because ultimately it has to deal with the issue of the Irish border and Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats have consistently said that unless there is a solution to the Irish border then a US-UK free trade deal is pretty much off the table so we really need to sort out our current relationship with the European Union and make sure that it doesn't cross any red lines with respect to the US relationship. So when President Trump just said in that press conference that uh, the U.S. has committed, Michael, to a phenomenal trade deal two or three times of what we're doing now, were his exact words, is that a promise he actually can't, he can't make? It isn't, a, it isn't a promise he can make, and certainly I don't think in the time allotted. Trade deals take an awful long time to put together, and if everything is on the table, including agriculture and the NHS, then they, they could cut across red lines with respect to our future relationship with the European Union. On, on the subject of food standards, the food standards are different um, between the, U, the EU and the US, so you'd need to unravel that Gordian knot before you unravel the Gordian knot of the Irish border. And what do you think the response will be to the fact that everything is on the table, according to President Trump? 
Well, certainly politically here in the UK, that's not a particularly good look, but I don't really think that we need to read as much into that as people think, because just because it's on the table at the beginning doesn't mean it's going to be on the table at the end. And the likelihood is it will get taken off the table very, very quickly by the UK side. There are other areas of common interest that we can do a deal on. It doesn't have to be everything. You can do it on a sector-by-sector -sector basis. Michael, what would you have liked to have heard from President Trump? Um, well, I'd certainly like to hear slightly more passion about the D-Day commemorations. Certainly in terms of the future relationship with the, with the UK and the US, I don't think there's really that much else he could have said, given the fact that he's not he doesn't really know who he's going to be talking to in a month's time when it comes to the next UK Prime Minister. So I think in terms of playing to his base, this plays very well for President Trump at home. I'm not sure what else it does with respect to the UK and the US. Michael Houston, good to have you with us. Thanks so much for joining us with your